What's going on guys and gals? Chris, the Bonafide Hustler coming to you live from the inside of my office and say we're gonna do a basic q and A. Should last like 20, 40 minutes, something like that. What's going on guys and gals? Hold on. Chris, the Bonafide Hustler comes to you live. Okay, so let me mute that. It always happens on YouTube live for some reason. Um, so yeah, that's what we're gonna do today. I'm gonna to answer your questions real quick. There should be a live feed and uh, for anyone else that's like tuning in after the fact, you just watch it, your own, watch it at your own pace, that kind of stuff. As always, if you want to learn a little bit more about me, what I'm about, if you want to learn more about me, uh, you can go check out www.bonafidehustler.com. And uh, there's a lot of cool things over there, as well as a new free guide that just came out like two days ago. So go check it out. 50 items that you can be finding at thrift stores and garage sales. Pretty cool. 50 profitable items. That guide is free. It's uh, sitting on my website, actually. So yeah, bonafidehustler.com. Go check it out. Okay. So it's good to see everybody here. We have RM Strapper, Joshua, Garbage Monster, Birdie, Guinevere, Swamp Picker, Joe Nunez. So um, let me uh, kind of answer questions. I, if I have the answer to some of these questions that are going to come through, and we're going to be talking about eBay and Facebook Marketplace. Um, like a, not even an hour ago, I sold something on Facebook Marketplace, which was pretty cool. If you follow my Instagram stories, you can kind of see what's going on. Um, but yeah, we'll be talking about things like that and the hustle in general. So if I can answer any of your questions, I will. If I don't know the answer to any of your questions or some of the questions, then I won't pretend like I know the answer, obviously. Um, so let me answer some of the questions that are coming here. Uh, Marrakech7, what's up, Chris? How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's Friday. You know, nice weather outside. Hopefully I'll score a mountain bike and ride it later. Um, but I have some things to do, plus I have to take something to the post office. So um, what else we got here? Joshua Davidson, how did you get the courage to leave your corporate job? Um, so the way I left my corporate job was a little bit interesting because I left my corporate job. I was already reselling at that point, but it wasn't to the point where I was like, I'm going to leave my corporate job for reselling. I left my corporate job um, to pursue a trading career. Right, right around 2008, 2009, which is arguably the worst time to ever have pursued a trading career ever in the history of forever, you know. Um, and so it didn't work out very well. Um, it was just kind of a slow bleed of money, basically. And uh, so around early 2010 or something like that, or maybe late 2009, I decided like uh, I've had enough, you know. <clears throat> and one of my trader friends, I actually wrote about this in an email today, <clears throat> but uh, one of my trader friends uh, told me you know, just follow what you love. And so I did. I became an insurance salesman after that. It's not what I loved, but I was like, oh, you know, I gotta, I gotta work for the man. I gotta make big money, you know, and never really thought that what I love to do could also make good money, big money, not big money, but enough money to survive and then some. And that's when, when I was working for farmer's insurance as an agency owner, I kind of knew that was after the trading career thing. I did that for like a year and I was like, I'm not really an owner of this whatsoever, you know, because I'm not in control of any of the rates and I didn't like that. If you don't have control on something, it's really hard to look at it as an investment or have real big pride over it, you know. So um, at that point, I decided to ditch it all and just do reselling. And so at that point, I was building an Amazon book, uh, explaining my reselling stuff. And then I formed the green room along with Steve Rakin and young at the time and college picker so we had a membership based site which we still have right now um and then i progressively over the years created guides and stuff like that which basically shortened the learning curve for people to you know learn reselling and make it work in their own hometown right across the world basically wherever you're from like seems to work uh, so how did i get the courage to leave my corporate job you know i left the corporate job for another thing first but if we're talking about the time when i was with farmers insurance what did I, I was just slowly, I wouldn't say I was slowly, I was just doing way more hustling than I cared about farmers. So at one point I was like, why do I even care to be an insurance owner, you know? And I was like, I'm pretty much out of here. And I think it was just one of those, uh, there was just another thing to go through with farmers. I think it was like another test or something like that um, to prove that you really want your agency. And I was like, hmm, like, I don't know if I really want my agency. So that, then at that point, I was like, it's not a critical moment, but it was the time to leave and just be like, I just want to pursue what I love to do, you know? So that was that. Um, uh, Joe Nunez, I wish I could answer this question. What's the best way to promote your eBay store? I wish I knew that way, but I'm going to speculate that it has to do with Instagram more than likely um, and potentially having a YouTube channel. But then again, if you you know release your store to all the people on YouTube and you open up your, um, I don't know, I think you could also open up yourself to a bunch of just people that might maybe hate your channel 
that screw with your eBay store. So be careful with that. But I think on Instagram, uh, that might be a better place to do it. What's up, VW Life? Matt is in the house. He just super chatted me two bucks. Thank you so much, Matt. I will use that to get coffee tomorrow morning before I go to garage sales, which probably won't happen. So maybe I'll go to thrift stores because it's going to rain tomorrow. Um, so yeah. Some really good questions are coming through. I'm going to try to answer as much as I can. I'm going to try to keep them really, really short. Um, okay. RM Strapper says, what is your best tip? What is your best tip for living in a smaller town? I have only four thrift stores in my town, Duluth, Minnesota. Not a ton of garage sales. So um, if you have four thrift stores, I would like learn the science behind these four thrift stores. Like for, inst for instance, when I was in Colorado, in Durango, Southern Colorado, small mountain town. Um, there were only maybe four thrift stores in that town. There was one pawn shop. Okay, so technically there are two pawn shops. One of them was like an outdoor store. Uh, there are actually two thrift stores. And there's a third thrift store. I don't count it as a thrift store because it's a mom and pop one. So they like price everything out the window. So it doesn't really count. I don't know how garage sales are, are at that town, but I can speculate they're pretty terrible. So basically what I'm saying is it's probably a very similar scenario. Um, in the short amount of time that I was in Durango, which in the past three years, might have been a cumulative amount of time, like maybe th three weeks. I studied those stores like left and right, and I was able to find really good finds, but I was finding things that were significant to Durango. So I'm not going to Durango looking for antique stuff or whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm in Durango looking for bikes and outdoor gears and all that kind of stuff that I can bring back to Austin. That's when I was on vacation in Durango. But my point is, if you have a weird scenario in a town, you have to see what the town can really give you, like hone in on what those thrift stores excel at having right first and then people in minnesota people in many you know i've had i've helped people in minnesota people in montana you know they have to drive sometimes 30 minutes an hour to get to a better town all right that has more opportunity so don't ever outrule one hour maybe even a two hour drive you know to get something good and if you're like well, what about gas well i mean it, you have to be committed to doing this if you want to make it work. Um, if you have a small car, get one of those Yakima like skybox topper things so you can have extra cargo um, and bring things back. But you have to be thinking on different lines if your current thrift scenario isn't super good. Now we can argue that my current thrift scenario isn't the best. You know, it's in Austin, Texas, which is a good, thriving, bustling town. You probably heard of Austin all over the news. But there's like serious traffic problems in this town, which make me like only look at certain thrift runs at certain times of the day. So if we're in the evening time, like I don't want to be downtown. It, it's like hell, you know what I'm saying? Um, and so I stick to the four thrift stores that are around my house, like up north, you know, um, and vice versa. Like if I'm downtown, I probably won't hit my north thrift store route just because I'm already downtown. So I don't have the best either. You know, people in Florida have thrift stores like every block, it seems, and they have garage sales like, you know, like multiple times a week. So you have to do the best with your scenario. You really do. And uh, there's no actual advice I can give you outside of like, if you've exhausted your own scenario, then look at closer by towns and invest the money and time to go scope that out and then hustle from there. Cause there've been plenty of people in the green room, for example, that have to go to towns that are one or two hours away and they do all their FBA stuff or they do all their garage shilling and then they come back and they bring their hoard of stuff back, process it. And it's enough to get by. Um, Okay, Harry Tornado, what is up, buddy? That's Josh, my friend, and uh, he is super chatting me five bucks. Hey, buddy, thank you so much. We have to do part two of that show. You know what I'm talking about. Enough comments came through, and they wanted more tips. So Josh and I, the Harry Tornado, we are going to be on another show together very, very soon, more than likely next week or the week after. Um, okay, what else we got here? Um, Daniel, Daniel Z, how do you decide which order to hit yard sales in? It's a really good question. If there are a bunch starting at eight, that sound good. What criteria do you use to figure out what order to hit them up? All right. So basically I use yard sale treasure map. It's an app that you can put on your iPhone or whatever Google device. And I, I highlight the night before, which is Friday. I highlight and I tap and I color code the ones that I want to go see. Now the ones I want to go see are based upon how the garage sale was written in Craigslist because these things are running off Craigslist APIs and stuff like that. So if it's in Craigslist, these other apps will pick them up, like Yard Sale Treasure Map or Gseller.com. All those apps will pick up off of Craigslist. So you want to take a look at the verbiage and how the, how the thing was constructed. If it just says garage sale, lots of good things. You know, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I'm going to mark that as a garage sale I want to go to. Now, if you see garage sale, household items, sporting goods, camping gear, you know, things like that, very vague terms, like I'm probably going to show up there. Um, if you see garage sale with $500 Trek bike, um, you know, uh, $150 Jack LaLanne juicer, uh, $100 coffee maker, 
um, and it has a lot, bunch of brand names to it and stuff like that, probably not going to go to that one, right? Because that person or those people kind of know what they have. So I will go to the ones that have vague descriptions in good neighborhoods. So I hope that helps you out. But that's basically what I do. It's, it's a recipe for like a constant success. Um, is there a particular order? You just do what's called down the street. So like you just go as you can get them down the street, good neighborhood behind good neighborhood behind a good neighborhood. So don't try to find yourself in a bad neighborhood because usually that's where the garage sales get pretty bad. I also like uh, neighborhoods that are getting recently gentrified as well. So neighborhoods that were once like not such a good part of town, maybe poorer part of town that are now becoming up and coming, you know, garage sales in those areas I find are really good as well. Uh, Bertie, what were you up to when you were 19? Uh, when I was 19, I was in college and I was, uh, you know, getting in trouble. I was getting hammered a lot, um, you know, dating girls and just being a normal college kid, basically. So that's what I was up to when I was 19. I was also going to bars because I had a fake ID. So I ain't gonna lie, you know, that's what I was up to when I was 19. <clears throat> but I was also working out a lot too. So I was uh, more than likely about 190, maybe 195 pounds. I was lifting a lot. Um, I had at 19, I had met almost everybody in the dorm that I was at. And I think there were 900 people in that dorm. So I had known just about everyone. Like I made it my mission to know everyone in the dorm on year one. And I did, um, which opened up a lot of like party situations and dating opportunities and all, all this really cool stuff. So that's what I was up to when I was 19. Okay. Evan S says, what book has changed your life the most? Um, uh, I, you know, that's a, that's a tough question. I look back at the books that are on the shelf and I mean, there are a lot of good books and they all hold like a special kind of place, you know, in my brain. Um, I would say out of like all of them, I mean, one of the ones that's most eye opening, I would probably say it would be expert secrets by Russell Brunson. I really like that one, but that's also because I'm an entrepreneur. So as of maybe the past three years, I'd say that's probably the most eye-opening book. But the book that I probably enjoyed the most over life is equal is probably the Napoleon Hill book, which is Think and Grow Rich, or it's The Luck Factor by Richard Wiseman, which I think is up there as well. I wrote about that in an email today as well, which is crazy. Um, so yeah, those two books are really good. Richard Wiseman, The Luck Factor is really, really good. Um, I always like talk about that book. Uh, rule number one by Phil Town is amazing as well. If you're into like investing, uh, I think rule number one by Phil Town is a really good book that breaks it down to very basic, you know, investment knowledge kind of stuff. Um, it does require you to kind of know about balance sheets and like how to get certain numbers that you can find off Yahoo and like Google and stuff. But uh, yeah, you can make some pretty sound investments through rule number one. Um, okay. What else we got here? Um, what happened to the other guy that was a partner in the green room? Not young. Uh, we had Cody Hawk on for about six months, maybe a year. And things didn't mesh as well as probably they should have. But so we split ways with Cody. It's not a big deal. Every now and then I still talk to Cody behind the scenes. So nice guy. Um, so yeah, the green room is down to me, Eric, which is college picker, Steve Rakin, and we have a amazing VA as well. Um, oh, and Eric's brother also helps us behind the scenes. Uh, Boog Doc says, what is your thoughts on Alan Edmonds shoes? I have a couple pairs that aren't even selling for $20, $30 a pair. Is it a size issue? Could be a size issue, but not all, all Alan Edmonds shoes are great. I mean, honestly, they're just not that good. Penny loafers and like weird things like that slip on styles. They're just not as you know good as a shell cordovan or a, uh, you know, a brogue wingtip or even a double, like a two tone brogue wing tip. There's just so many different variants, but uh, there's some really bad ones as well. And just because it says Allen Edmonds, be careful with that kind of stuff. And I know in the thrift space, you know, people are like, oh my God, Polo Ralph Lauren. Oh my God, like Columbia PFG shirts. And like, oh my God, Allen Edmonds and Echo, you know, all these. You have to be really careful. As a novice thrifter or an intermediate thrifter, you should always, always, always heed the rule. When you hear big popular brands like that, Tommy Hilfiger and stuff like that, do your due diligence behind the scenes, locate model numbers, see if you can find exact sold models of what you are holding in your hand before you pull the trigger. Because if you don't, you get into a situation kind of like this one right here, where you have a couple pairs that aren't even selling for $20 or $30 a pair when you probably thought that they were going to do so well because everyone stressed Allen Edmonds, but they never clarified it. See, when I talk about Allen Edmonds, I try to clarify it as much as possible. If you buy my shoe, guide uh, shoes to bucks 
you'll notice that Allen Edmonds and stuff like that's a very small portion of what I resell because it's not every day you find a really good super you know winning Allen Edmonds shoe for example so anyway um, that's my answer to that what else we got here um, anyone find anything cool this morning that's from Swamp Picker um, I didn't go thrifting this morning but you know, I'm going to go tomorrow. I might go later on today. I'm not 100% sure. Adam's exploits. Hey, Chris, now look, looks now like Lisa Bonet's husband used to look. Yeah, so I guess with the beard, I think he's referring to the Aquaman guy. Um, okay, Austin traffic is tough. Yes, it is. I'm looking at the comments, which are like right here. So if it doesn't look like I'm looking at the camera, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> some people are saying some pretty funny stuff. Uh, here's a good question. Do I ever buy returns on Amazon or other places? I do not buy returns, although I wouldn't write it off because I've never done it before. It sounds interesting, but I've never done it before. That's from Latino, Mas Interested El Mundo. Um, so yeah, I can't write off things that I've never done before. Uh, yeah. Uh, Jay LeBlanc says, it's first time catching you live. What is up, Jay? Good to see you in here. Thank you for being here. What's up, Cool Hands Suit? Good to see you as well um awesome advice says daniel z what up ogc that's my friend right there um marikech7 says hey chris when is a good time to hit the rei clearance sale all right so i don't know if you're talking about the rei garage sale or the clearance sale i don't know the clearance is not anything to be special there's nothing special about rei clearance now rei garage sale that's a different story rei garage sale should on average happen four times a year and um this is basically when rei opens its doors opens its doors typically an hour early for its uh, members. And uh, to be a co-op member, you just go there and you pay like 20 bucks and you're there, you're a co-op member forever. I think it's 20 or 25 bucks. So it's well worth it. Um, so when's a good time to hit the REI garage sale? I guess that's what the person's saying. I would, I have been to REI garage sales as early as two in the morning for like a nine o'clock start time. I've actually slept outside of REIs before. Um, but typically I find that if I show up about five or six o'clock, it's just as good. I might be like two or three people behind where I would have been at two o'clock in the morning. Um, that said, the REI garage sale is a place where they take the store returns and pretty much store returns. And it can be returned for any reason. It could just be like incorrect size, like didn't fit, um, you know, weird feeling on foot, you know. So they take all this inventory and then like four times a year, they just release it to the members only for like ridiculously uh, low prices. Typically, um, there was a time where the prices were like 80% off, 90% off. And it was like really easy to crank out a thousand bucks or more from an REI garage sale, like really freaking easy. Now it's actually really hard. And I think it's because as a brick and mortar store, it's getting harder for REI to make money. So they have to like really try to find ways to make money. And one of the ways is to like maybe not sell the garage sale items so cheap anymore. And it used to be a really lucrative way to make some good money. But now it's a really good way to get some awesome outdoor gears, for, outdoor gear for yourself. And if you happen to be around an REI that uh, I always say check back around midday to see if they go 50% off everything else or just shoes only. It's worth checking back because some REIs will do 50% off later in the day. And when that hits, it's definitely worth checking out. Um, <laughs> so yeah, REI is really cool. It stands for recreational, wait, something, something, something. Oh, I can't remember anymore. REI, weird. Okay, I used to know. Anyway, um, I know you have another channel, so this is a bit off topic. This is from Melissa for this channel, but have you thought about doing a nutritional guide? So I'm not a licensed nutritionist, but I am working on a fitness product that will be coming out probably like one or two months. So just so you guys know, it's, I mean, it's a little bit more like mindset oriented, but there's going to be a free guide first. That's going to be really good. Um, and then there's going to be a workout plan that's going to be a little bit more male oriented. But the free guide is going to be really interesting. I think, you're, you know, when, when you see that come up on the bot damn YouTube channel, then make sure you get that free guide because I'm going to make sure it's going to be really good. Um, but outside of that, I'm going to be building workouts that I have been testing out for the past, you know, months, years, proven workouts that get me into amazing shape whenever I want to. Those will be up for grabs. Uh, not free, though, but uh, up for grabs. And then there'll be several tiers down the line with the final tier probably being some sort of like fitness meetup or uh, retreat of something like that. So that's kind of like what I'm thinking. But uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Have I ever thought about doing a nutritional guide? Um, I mean, I know what to eat. So I probably, I am going to be putting some of that stuff in the guide for sure. Okay. Um, 
Recreational Equipment Incorporated. That's what Maria Nunez says. That's right. That's what it is. Okay. Um, look forward to the free guide. It says Melissa. Oh, good. There's also a free, if you're interested in like reselling and like finding stuff from garage sales, finding stuff from thrift stores and putting on eBay and Facebook marketplace and making money on that kind of stuff. I just launched a free guide two days ago, two. Okay. Free, like hundred percent free. This is not like something, something to bucks or anything like that. It's none of that stuff. <clears throat> Although my actual paid guys are pretty good. I ain't gonna lie. And that's because most people say that actually I don't find any bad flack on my guides, but that's okay. Um, the only bad flack I got ever on one of the guides was someone that said, oh, when I bought your shoes to Bucks guide, I thought it'd be like every shoe, like known to man, like would be in there and like Yeezys and everything, which was just like, how could any guide be that encompassing? Like, it's just like, it's not going to exist. No one is that big of an expert on shoes, like nobody. So my shoe guide is basically my take on the shoe flipping game for the past 16 years of my life. Like the correlations between what sells and what doesn't. All the stuff that I think it sells that it was worth your guys' time is in that guide. So, but yeah, that was like the number one, that was like the only negative thing I've ever got for any one of my guides. Like, I'm pretty proud that, you know, there's not, I, I search a lot and I don't see anything. But this free guide, by the way, is available on bonafidehustler.com. So it should, within seconds of you being on that page, it'll pop up. You can get it. And then, uh, yeah, it's a, I mean, you're going to be viewing it within like seconds. So, um, Really good guy. The new one is gonna, is really cool. You'll like it. Um, Alan, hey, Bonafide, I just got into this three months ago, and I'm addicted. I saved, saved all my flips. Hopefully, you saved all your profit is what you meant. Um, because Okay, so my question is, have you used liquidation.com? Is it worth it? I have not. I haven't used liquidation.com, bulk.com, any of those things. I just, it's, there are like a million things to, wait. there are a million ways to make money. Like, I didn't go down that road because it's not, something I did. I went down the road of YouTube, building guides, forming a Facebook group behind the scenes. I did stuff like that. That's just as much time as I have. That's what I did with it. I mean, I should have probably tried everything, but my personality gravitates towards certain things. And I never try to ignore what my personality gravitates towards. It means I like it. There's energy there. So I hone in on those things. Um, all right. When you pay your taxes, VW life, when you pay your taxes, do the cost of goods get subtracted from the total? Um, yeah, I track everything that I buy, every single thing that I buy, um, whether it's FBA related or eBay related, every single thing. Yeah, so I do it. I take the cost of goods out, any fees, any shipping, and then I'm left with like a pure profit. So yeah, and then I claim that. Um, OGC, hey, yo, Chris, do you want to go on a run when I come to Austin, LOL? Well, it'll probably be 100 degrees in about um, five weeks, which is when the meetup is, about six weeks from now. Do I want to go on a run? I'm not much of a runner. Like I've done a lot of things. I've, I've tried running, trail running and stuff like that. It's just my, my psyche, I guess my personality, whatever. Um, it likes more risk oriented things, I guess. And so that's why I tend to go mountain biking more. And I, I don't know when it comes to like flat out endurance type stuff, I tend to get bored, but that's just me. Um, but the things that I do like, I like surfing, I like mountain biking, I like wake surfing, I like wakeboarding, I like snowboarding. I like things where like, if you're not focusing even for a split second, like things could go incredibly wrong. But for some reason I dig that. So um, I feel alive when I do those things. That's just the bottom line. So I always gravitate towards the thing that I, the things that make me feel really, really good. And plus I can build real, uh, a lot of skills within those niches as well. So, uh, you know, just when you think you're doing well, you can learn a new trick or something like that. Whereas if I'm running or something, I don't can't learn a new trick if I'm swimming in a pool, you know, 100 laps. Like there's no new trick to learn. It's just torture for me. If I run, there's no new trick, I guess, if I run. Like I, I don't know what a new trick would be. If I go mountain biking, I can do different things, you know, tail whip. I can approach a jump differently. I can go flying off a ledge a different way. There are a lot of things that I can, I can do. Um, I can get better at it quickly and I can see the results. So I guess that's the reason why I don't run and I don't do extended amounts of swimming or anything like that. But I like other things like surfing that are swimming related, but have, I guess, dire consequences <laughs> if I don't do things correctly, you know? Um, Daryl V says, longboard or shortboard? I can do both. I prefer longboards and hybrids which are like in the middle uh or thrusters so 
I'll try, when I go back to Cali this summer, I'm going to try a little bit more shortboard stuff, but we'll see. I think with shortboards, I have to be a certain weight and a lot more, uh, a lot more conditioned because it's just less buoyancy, you know. Um, is my brother a nurse? He's not a nurse yet. Um, he's still training to be training to be one. Uh, Saint Rogue, how are the prices at thrift stores in Austin? By the way, you remind me so much of Jason Momoa. Okay, well, thank you so much for the compliment. Um, how are the prices at the thrift stores in Austin? They are high, but within that, there's so much being donated, I think, that where a lot of things fall through the cracks and still provides a good arbitrage opportunity for me to go out a couple times a week and then you know hit garage sales and stuff like that and still make some good money. So I like it. Um, <laughs> rain in the forecast tomorrow in Austin. That's true. It sucks. Uh, Jesus Bermudez or Jesus Bermudez, what do you recommend selling a trike? So a trike should be sold locally. It's just big. Uh, they're fun to ride. Um, uh, depending on which one you have, the ones that have the pneumatic tires are worth more than the ones that are just using, um, just normal plastic wheels. Uh, so yeah. So if you have the one with pneumatic tires, meaning you can actually air up the tires, then those are worth, I wouldn't say significantly more, but they're worth more than the ones that have, uh, just almost like, uh, just roller blading looking big wheels. Um, okay, so Linuela Felizari, I'm gonna try to get into these questions faster. I've been watching you for some years and done some thrifting and garage sale in Austin, but I never had the pleasure of seeing you or e-money. How much do you make, oh wow, what a question. How much do you make a month? I can't answer that, that's a little too much. That, that's a little direct, but uh, you know, I make enough. I make enough to to live and save. So that's, I'll, I'll, I'll say it like that. Um, but yeah, plenty of people have seen me and e-money out on Saturdays, plenty. Um, so if anybody's ever like, oh, Bonafide us or you always don't you're sitting behind and making money on guides, like that is entirely false and so far from like the truth. People see me all the time at thrift stores and out there, like all the time. Like I got spotted, shoot, I might've been yesterday on Wednesday. Was that yesterday? No, that was two days ago. Okay, so I got spotted Wednesday when I did the hot shot. Like as soon as I was checking out, like got spotted actually a minute after I was thinking in my head, like I haven't been spotted today. And then one minute later I got spotted. So kind of funny, but yeah. So, but that's nothing that I need to prove to anybody or whatever, but I just, just I think hopefully through as much Instagramming as I do and the hot shots and the filming and stuff, you guys figure out like he's not sitting at home, you know? Um, Mark Corbett, I want to get into bicycling. Any good touring bikes you would recommend without breaking the bank, mostly paved some gravel. I would say that the REI, not the REI, the, uh, How's that brand? Um, Novara, the, which is an REI brand, but the Novara Safari is a pretty good uh, bike that won't break the bank. You can find them for around two to like 400 bucks um, and they can do a lot. So that's a good one. The Novara Randani as well is a pretty good bike that will not break the bank that is super well built. Um, okay, I'm gonna go to the bottom now of all the comments. And see if I can uh, get, <laughs> and see if I can get some more of these done. Does the spaceship ever leave Austin, Stephen M? You know, Austin has enough opportunity for me to keep the spaceship in it. But when the spaceship leaves Austin, it goes to it doesn't even go to nearby towns. It goes on vacation, and when it goes on vacation, it always hustles in wherever destination it's at. So, yeah. Now I did get another spaceship the other day. I got a I got an escape pod, is what people are calling it. Um, I got a space pod. Um, and this spaceship is small. Um, this spaceship is made by Scion. Uh, this spaceship was used. The spaceship was very cheap. And a spaceship is five speed, meaning I can barely vlog in it, you know, because I have to pay attention. But um, yeah, that opens up a lot of other possibilities. Uh, and I might be getting a Thule topper for it soon as well, which means it's needing to have like double the capacity. But um, yeah, we bought, I bought it for many reasons, which we can make a video about that later because I think it's a thought process that a lot of people should be thinking about. It was what led me to buy this thing. But basically, it has to deal with depreciation and Toyotas and like all this crazy stuff and uh, gas prices and speculation and hedging. And so I bought another car, you know. Uh, so we'll see. So far, my car on the first tank got 30 miles a gallon. I'm mostly city, so that's pretty good. And I know that because I calculated that two days ago. Um, if I'm ever in Malibu or LA, let's go for a surf. Deal, Daryl V. Deal. That sounds like fun. Um, 
What else we got here? Any more questions? We got a ton of questions. Okay, so thanks for the videos. This is Eric Wright. Been selling six months and will leave my nine to five in a week to go full time hustler. Reselling will be, will be one of my three hustles I'll be doing. Cool. So if you're gonna leave your job, just make sure you have like three to five months of money saved up and have some sort of like like living expenses. This is what this is what I'll give you as advice. If you're gonna think about li leaving your corporate job or whatever, I would say a minimum of really six months of living wages, like what it takes for you to live, not counting astronomical. Uh, asteroid hits or anything like that you should always have an asteroid fund that's somewhere between five and ten grand um and if you are a homeowner it should be closer to the 10 grand mark meaning if an ac goes out then you're not like sitting there going oh my god where am i going to find this money then you like present for a credit card and off you go into like uh you know never being debt free very hard to become debt free once you start doing things like that but you know a well calculated exit from a corporate job it's definitely amazing it's respectable don't burn your bridges or anything like that um but you're gonna to wanna to save uh, six months of your fixed costs. So think about all the things that you're liable for, whether it be car payments, mortgages, rent, insurance, cell phone, you know, average food that you consume a month, um, everything, gas, put it down on a piece of paper, times six, save all that up before you even remotely think about leaving a corporate position. And then um, try to have five and 10 grand behind that as an asteroid fund in case an asteroid comes into your world and you know decides to smash it all to pieces so an asteroid fund is really crucial and like i said it's more if you're a homeowner and if you own a car that is not japanese with over a hundred thousand miles i would go ahead and comfortably kind of say something like that so if it's a japanese car you're a little bit safer but yeah if you have a used car with like high miles on it that's, those can also be money traps as well um, what's up, Tracy? Uniquely Money says, hit the like button, please. Okay, so I don't ever, I, I forget to ask this on my shows, but yeah, hit the like button on the show if you can, if you like the content. Um, I appreciate appreciate it, VW Life. Um, yeah, and Swamp Picker is clarifying maybe even nine to 12 months, it depends on your lifestyle. So first of all, if, you're, if lifestyle should be one of the last things you consider when you are trying to go full-time into reselling like you really have to live, live cheap for a while because um you know i say that but like when i did it it was just like reliable like i knew that i could do well reselling because i had really good options and the majority of people that watch my channel live in towns that have good options so you know if you're so confident maybe you can go down to three months or four months saving up money you know only but i would say six is about right um if you're 100 percent a beginner to an intermediate you're just real stoked to work for yourself the problem no one ever sees is the fact that when you work for yourself you are up against you so all your worst habits and all your worst fears are going to come to fruition so fast and they're going to start messing with you and what i mean by that is like something as simple as waking up a little later than normal uh going to bed a little later than normal not getting good sleep so you feel like crap like all these little things start to manifest and you're gonna have to conquer that and make money, right? So I'm just telling you as an entrepreneur, and if you decide to make stuff in the background and create things, it's even harder. So like, it's gonna be you against you. You think like, oh, I'm not gonna have a boss. That's horse, you know what? Uh, you're gonna have a boss and you are your own boss. So if you are a kind of like laid back individual, then you're gonna, have, you know, that's cool to have a laid back boss, but like nothing gets done. So you kind of have to train yourself to be super proactive and get things done, which is one of the hardest things in life to understand. So just be real careful, guys. That's all I'm saying, you know. Bearded pickers in the house, what up? Reselling makes me live cheap, hardly pay retail. That's, that's a really good way to look at reselling. I love that part too. Um, that's the best part. I think that's one of the best parts is like, look, when you want to make money, you have to understand that saving money is making money. So if you can live cheaper, and like, kind of like live the same lifestyle, like you're winning right there. Now, if you can make money and live cheaper, it's almost like getting a 20 to 50% raise. It's crazy. So think about that. Uh, John Haywood, one of my really good buddies who actually proofed bags to bucks and shoes to bucks for me. I've never met him in real life, by the way, but I feel like I know John very well uh, <laughs> because we talk all the time behind the scenes. But anyways, yeah, he's one of the ones that helped me proof those guides before they went out to market. And you might be thinking, that's crazy. Like you trust someone that you don't know? Yeah, I do. I mean, I have no reason not to trust him, right? I have, a, I have a loyal subscriber that wants to talk to me behind the scenes. I'm like, you know what? Why don't I have a loyal subscriber? Look at my guides first. 
That way I can kind of get an accurate portrayal of what the marketplace might think of it before it launches. So I think about things like that. I don't think I need to like some pay thousands of dollars to an editor or whatever like that when I can have someone that is just really diehard and a good a good supporter of my channel help me out. Um, so yeah, he gets to see all the guides for free and I get to get all these like, you know, feedback things and bullet points, which I take and I revise the guides slightly where I need them and typos and stuff like that. And then I issue it out and I issue my guides out at like 90 to 95% completion. Like I don't ever try to do a perfect guide or anything like that because it'll never get issued if I want perfect. So you have to understand as an entrepreneur, if you're seeking perfection, it's probably like the worst habit ever. Like I always issue out my stuff, a couple of typos here and there. Um, you know, I try to get them all, but it's not nearly impossible. So anyways, <laughs> and he's saying he's making money on the guide. So there you go. And I don't, I'll pay you later, John. No, I don't, I don't, you know, he says whatever he wants to say. And that is good with me. Um, if it needs improvement, I need to know. And I'm okay with the public knowing too. Um, Jerry Van Meter says, awesome videos, man. Thanks for being genuine and authentic. I also now love Cortados. Cortados are so good. I'm with you, Jeremy. I, I agree. Um, Steven, okay, so Steven, Steven Rowe Resale. Steven Rose Resale. Okay, cool. Have I ever tried the bins in Austin? Okay, so what this question is alluding to is there are bins in a lot of big towns, and bins basically you go a place and like they line everyone up and then they get these bins out um and they like say okay everyone can go to the bins and like everyone goes shuffling through the bins and most people have like bags around their shoulder and then they start pulling things out because at the end you pay by weight um so i've been to those situations they don't really mesh with me and like my psyche and personality but i'm not going to write them off completely there's another bins that got built in austin after i went to the primary one and i found some stuff when i went a couple times to bins but it just wasn't like my thing um, but plenty of people make really good money going to the bins. I know a person firsthand, his name is Q, and he does, you know, well over six figures just messing with bins. Now, of course, he invests somewhere between maybe 20 and 35 hours on the bin project, I speculate. But, uh, you know, when you look at people that are stuck in their office for 40 to 60 hours a week, not even making 65 grand, for example, you know, all of a sudden going to bins and like, conversating with cool people and like having people help you out and he goes to garage sales all the time you know all of a sudden that doesn't sound like a bad idea if you're maxing out 35 or 40 hours a week and you make it over 100 well over 100 grand i've seen the guy's numbers he's legit super awesome um i always vouch for q if you ever need my you know my <laughs> i don't know my, my my seal of approval i mean he he works hard for what he gets um i think he has a youtube channel called eagle eyes nation although i don't know how much he's been uploading things on it but i know he's got one but yeah, I mean, people can make big money doing whatever. See, the, pro, the not the problem, but what the reason why someone like you does very well is because he loves doing that, right? If you love something, there's energy towards that thing. But if you deny the energy and you're like, I want to try this, I want to try liquidation.com, I want to try, you know, shipping books on Amazon FBA, FBA. then I want to maybe try wholesaling. And then after that, I'm going to go, you know, buy bikes to bucks and I'm going to do bikes. Like, you know, you have to do, I think you should try a lot of things. And then, you figure out what you can see yourself doing effortlessly, having fun for five or 10 more years of your life. You know, like, that's the kind of mentality you should have. Like, you know, can I see myself doing this for five or 10 more years just like this and optimizing that? If you're like, oh, I hated that. I hated the whole process of, process of doing that. It costs too much gas to get there. Like, you know, if you hate those things, it's not even worth messing with anymore, right? It's worth looking further into the things that absolutely get you going and you like it. And you find yourself when you're not even you know, when you're not even thinking about it, you're like researching more about it, you know, for example. So I think that's the reason why people like thrift stores and garage sales so much is because it's dynamic, it's fun. It's in most hometowns, people can execute it and get rewarded pretty quick. Um, whereas other things require a much bigger process and sometimes systems and sometimes overhead costs such as warehouses to get big things going, you know? So I'm all about it. I'm not saying any one thing is better than the other, but I am saying, that follow the feelings that are in your brain and your heart. Like they're, those are, they're there for a reason. People that don't follow what they love end up living lives full of misery and just, you can just almost see it when you like interact with them. It's like, there's no passion there. So, you know, follow your passion no matter what it is, but try all the different things out there. I urge you guys to try all the different things because you'll never know what your passion is until you try it all really. Um, <clears throat> 
Uh, here's one, VW Life. If you get your GoPro 7 in the new spaceship, you can use the voice. Oh, that's a really good insight, dude. Yes, I have the GoPro Hero 7. He says, if you get your GoPro Hero 7 in the new spaceship, which is five speed. When I say it's new spaceship, it's new to me, but it is a used spaceship. I want everyone to know it's a used spaceship. It has like 90,000 miles on it. Um, he says, you can use the GoPro. Yeah, he's right. The GoPro, you know, start recording. Like it's a voice activation thing to be hands-free. It's a really good suggestion. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Um, Steven says, thank you for the knowledge. I've been inspired by your consistency. It's helped me make be, it's helped me be more aware of treating my business like an employment opportunity. And I am the employer. LOL. Yeah. All right. So someone said cut my hair. And then someone's saying not cut my hair. So Saul, salty nuts. Clever little name there. It says cut my hair. Don't cut my hair. And someone else said cut my hair. Interesting. We got Ahmed Martin saying, uh, giving me a $2 super chat saying, how often do you repost the same items on Facebook? You know, as of like a week ago, I've noticed that there is, or maybe I've lost it, but I don't see a post again or repost again button yet. Maybe I'm not seeing it, but as of maybe three or four days ago, I can't find that button anymore on my Facebook. I know they've redone Facebook a little bit, but I can't see the button. I don't know if that means it's an evergreen kind of thing. And when you press mark item as sold or delete item, that's the only way you can get them off your marketplace. I'm not 100% sure right now. Um, but the question is, how often do you repost the same items on Facebook? So before that whole thing was going down, I would repost them every, what, seven or eight days, whenever Facebook allows you to do a, uh, like a relist, you know? And it'll say it was like a time ticking thing. It was like two days left till repost or something like that, or one day left till you can repost again. I had like a little time ticker on each one. So, um, yeah. What else we got here? Um, we got other people talking in the feed. What are they talking about here? Sorry, I, I'm like trying to figure out what's going on. Okay. Um, yeah, and there's a boost button now. Fit. Yeah, so if someone said that I can't find the repost either button. So I don't know what that means at this point. It's, it's too new. Yeah, okay, so I guess it's too new for me to know right now. But uh, okay, so John Haywood said, I did some sourcing here in Portland, which is Oregon, awesome. Like I've always wanted to hustle Oregon. Military boots, Patagonia bags, good stuff. Connecticut, just not as good in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, some people have it. I mean, Steve Ray can, seems to make it happen in Connecticut, you know? Um, I think he's more into like books and stuff. Um, but that's just because his business uh, model now is one and done. So like he would much rather scan something or put it into FBA, it, it'd be out of his hair, he gets paid behind the scenes, whatever he gets paid, and then it's out of the way. So he can focus on other things that really interest him. And I get it, you know? Um, someone that is at their house for almost every day, like myself, I can run an eBay business off of a half of a wall of my garage and it's fun and it's good. Everything's pre-boxed, I love it. Um, and I can still run a Facebook marketplace business and a Craigslist business out from my property because I'm here. Now, when I'm not here, um, I put my store on vacation mode like everyone else. FBA still pays me behind the scene a little bit and then Antique Mall pays me behind the scenes and then I have the guides and I have the green room and I have, you know, like everything's fine, but it all came from one central thing, which was reselling, you know, reselling 16, 18 years ago. Um, I loved it and I kept messing with it. Right. And I loved it even more. And I kept just getting better and better and better and better, and better, exponentially better to the point now where if I go thrifting, it's almost guaranteed I find something really good, like almost every single time. And it's not like, Oh, you live in the best town. It's because I know a lot when I go into the thrift stores, I've purposely done that for myself to hedge against, um, like things like bicycles, for example, when bicycles got a little bit, just a little bit harder to find because I was finding them all the time. I used to have a company minivan back in the day. And I would remember on the weekends, me and my girlfriend at the time would like clear out the minivan of all my uh, marketing materials. Um, and I would just like, we would take the seats out and everything. And we would go to pawn shops and buy like three to six bikes at a time and throw it in the back of that thing. And uh, it was a lot of fun. I didn't pay for any gas, so I was like, this is really cool. Each of those map, each of those bikes I would be making somewhere between at the low end, like 80 bucks, and at the high end, like $200 a piece. Um, now, that was, of course, over the next two to four weeks when I would sell them, but um, I did that, and it was fun. But I knew when I started realizing, even for a second, 
that the supply was getting a little tighter and it was because more people were moving into town and some people were finding out about the bike thing, you know, um, I knew that it was time to start looking at other things or really emphasize learning. And I think everybody needs to do this right now. If you haven't done this and you're like, well, I'm all about clothing and that's all I need to do. Like you're, you're missing so much in a thrift store and a garage sale. If all you do is clothing and look for clothing. I know people that go to garage sales and estate sales and all they do is CDs and, or some, all, only, all they do is books. And I sit there and I'm like, you need to train yourself for when this stuff gets completely exhausted. Like you don't want to be running around like, what do I do now? You know, like, what do I do now? If long-term storage fees go you know, 30 to 50% higher out of nowhere, you just took a 30 to 50%, um, you know, like raise in a sense sometimes if you think about it. Uh, oh, sorry, not a raise. You took a cut, you know? So you gotta be thinking about things like that. Um, and I, I saw those things early and I was like, it's time. It, it's really, really, it emphasized, I should say it this way. I knew very early, 14 years ago, it was important to diversify. I just knew that just because of investing and everything like that, but I saw it in markets, though it doesn't matter if it's Dow Jones oriented or whatever, NASDAQ, or even thrift stores, markets reach a certain point when they get efficient um, and the arbitrage opportunities are not there anymore. And so that just means you have to find another market to play in. That's it. Um, Nevermore Antiques is saying, reselling is getting crowded, so you have to always be expanding. It's true. You have to always, always, always be expanding. And never, never, never be afraid of taking what you're really, really good at, making a guide out of it, or a course, or what's the thing that Rally Roots does? It's not a course. I guess it is a course. I don't know. It's a mentorship program, right? Don't, like, don't ever be afraid of doing stuff like that. Um, there's some people um, in the reselling space that are like, oh, man, you know, it's all this paid content. Good for, good for that. You know, a free, a free market should have everything and the actual market decides what's worth money and what's not worth money. But for someone that sometimes doesn't have anything to offer goes, you know, this person's offering Patreon, that person's offering guides and this person's got a paid Facebook group. So all this stuff is so biased and you're like, that doesn't make any sense. You know, like it's a market. If people like the product and they find value, then they buy it. But if the market sucks, then everyone talks about it, how it sucks. You know what I'm saying? But that's what markets do. Um, when a stock is in trouble, it's all over the airwaves, right? And people get out of it. Uh, when a stock, you know, has a really good forecast or um, quarterly earnings, for example, hits the airwaves. Everyone wants to be in it, you know? And I think that's the same thing with the reselling space. But sometimes we have people in the space that want to control this for whatever reason. I don't know why. Um, and they want to impose a lot of their own beliefs on things that are completely out of their, their control. But anyways, I don't want to highlight any names. I'm just saying, if you're ever thinking like, and you are a creator and you're, you have a YouTube channel and you're thinking, man, I wish I could create a guide, but no one buys guides. Or like, I heard guides are stupid or, um, you know, they frown upon guides in this, this community. Don't listen to any of that. None of it, right? Make sure you build the best guide possible. Make sure you over deliver and like put your heart and soul into that guide and you should be fine, right? If you act in a good way, it'll show through the guide and the guide will make you money. And that's another income stream that you can have behind the scenes. So I think it's a terrific idea or a mentorship program or a course, whatever you want to do, you know, t-shirt line, merch, any way you want to do it. I say, go for it. Um, Nevermore Antiques. Yeah, when people don't like paid content, but every video is garbage, click. It's crazy, man. Um, Bertie, what do you think about crypto and like, is it Litecoin? Okay, so crypto, basically Bitcoin, Litecoin. Have I ever invested in it? I have not, but I actually, I ain't going to lie. Like, honestly, I'm looking for a, re a decent retracement. I'm probably going to get in, I don't know, sometime in the next two to six months, I would think. I'd probably put a decent investment in there. So we'll see. Um, I'm looking for another retracement though, a good one, <laughs> not the one, I mean, there was, it had a pretty good, uh, well, it had a micro spike four days ago, maybe five days ago. So, but I want to see it test the lows again and then I'll go. Um, what else we got here? Any more questions? I'm going to hang around for like five more minutes. Um, I tend to tend to ramble sometimes on these uh, Q and A's, but I want to give you guys as many good you know tips as I can. 
Um, Side Hustle Jack says, wife and I are full time now. And we have about four months savings listing like crazy. There you go. There's so many like, you know, partner couples, especially on Instagram. So if you ever think that you're feeling down or something like that and you go to YouTube and you're like, there's not that many couples on YouTube, maybe Nick Hills or is it Nick, Nate Hills or Nick, Nick and Andrea Hills. I want to say there's the rally roots. That's a couple. Um, Ben Pickers, there's a, you know, there's some, there's just not a whole lot, but on Instagram, there are a ton. So if you ever if you are feeling down about your situation or something like that, just surround yourself with other people that are in the same situation that are just doing well, maybe better, you know, see what they're doing, see what they're into and go with it. Um, oh man. Ahmed Martin says, I saw slot cards on your last guide. Oh geez. Well, that's one of the things. I bought a small lot for 20 and sold for 200. Man, uh, that's pretty good. <laughs> My last really good slot car uh, buy, God, what was it? I think I remember it was a Tyco set. It actually made it on the guide. I think I was 12 or $15 into it. I think that one sold for 200. Let me just put it in here. I'll put it in my email. I save all my stuff. So I'll tell you what it sold for right now. Um, let's see here. Instant payment. Here we go. It was a Tyco Electro, <laughs> Tyco Electric four lane racing track Magnum 440 X2 with four exotic super slot cars, model number 6693, sold for $229.99. There you go. That was on November 16th of 18. So, yeah, there's some money. Definitely money. And that was, I swear, that was 12 or 15 bucks at the Old Lady Thrift Store on a Wednesday. Um, cool hand, Sue. Do you check comps at yard sales shrewdly or pretty much out in the open? Um, I'll do it out in the open and stuff like that. See, this is the thing. I think there's a slight advantage to kind of looking the way that I do it. I'm not saying that in a, oh, my God, he's so cocky way. I say that in a, I don't know. Like here in Austin, people are really nice, but there are a lot of standoffers people. I mean, kind of a, like I'm a, I'm six foot tall, I'm kind of big. Like I don't know, and I got the long hair thing going on, so I don't know. It's I'm not super super approachable. But once you get to know me, like everyone's like, he's a cool guy. So I think that plays to my advantage um, when I'm doing something on the phone. Like I don't think anyone's gonna be like, hey, what are you doing on that thing? Like no one's gonna be like that. Um, but it, I don't know. I can just read people very well. Some people just don't want to talk to me based upon the stature that I carry around, I guess. So it's also another, I'll give you a pro a pro thrifter tip right here. Maybe that only works if you're six foot tall and you are got long hair or whatever. But uh, if I go down an aisle of a, of a thrift store, that's about as wide as a cart. And uh, I'll actually do this a lot of times. Like, you know how there's like, you go into a thrift store, there's four to eight aisles going down, right? Um, I might just pick one of the four just out of nowhere and just go down it, right? But if I see like a card at the end and it's all wedged in the aisle real good, I will actually in, I will actually like puff my chest out more, stand up as tall as I can, like jingle my keys around so that people know I'm coming. Nine out of ten, or if not ten out of ten times the person will take their cart and like squish it up against the clothes, like all up into the hangers and everything just to make me go through. Um, but it just goes to show you that if you make people aware and you adjust your posture, that people realize like I'm doing something wrong here. Like I'm putting my cart in this thing that's like only this wide. Like I've had people back out of the lane real quick and like go completely out of it. I've had people go, I'm so sorry. Like, but those are the, some of the things you have to do when you go to garage sales and stuff like that. If I don't want someone to talk to me, for example, like I'll assume a certain stature and I'll do certain things that will kind of just seal off any hope of conversation. So um, Guinevere says, don't mince your words. You look like a wild man. Okay, so there it is. Maybe that's what I was looking for. Um, um, what else we got here? So yeah, I, I check out pretty much in the open, but I'm not really like, looking at an item then like I have my eBay. If, usually if I'm doing something, I'll have my phone kind of high and I'll have it to where the screen that can't see it. So you don't know if I'm texting somebody or if I'm looking up something on eBay. But honestly, at the, at the level that I am at, right, with 16 or 18 years behind doing what I do, like I kind of have a really good idea of what sells already to where 
I'm only doing the phone thing every now and then. Like I don't do it a whole lot. I do it more for FBA things than anything, but outside of that, then yeah, I don't. Um, <laughs> all right. So I guess that's pretty much, let me see if there's any more questions. Um, all right. I think that's pretty much it. Okay, cool. So, um, all right, let me ask it. Let me answer this one last. Kamikaze Comedy says, do you think offering free shipping helps sell items easier? Yeah, I think we live in a free shipping lifestyle. I think you have to at least consider offering it on all your eBay items. Um, I think if you're like, oh, did you go? I want to make sure I don't get burned by shipping. All right, so just roll shipping into your price and have an average idea of like what shipping will cost you. You get burned a couple of times, it's okay. You just adjust every item from that point forward so you don't get burned but you just have to un understand that you also make money on some of the items as well so it kind of flats itself out once you have a good idea of what the shipping rates are so yeah i uh, add shipping on top does it sell slower look if you have quality items or high ticket items or things like that and you're not buying run-of-the-mill stupid items that are just like polo ralph lauren freaking polo shirts like come on seriously like why do people think that this stuff is worth their time? It's like, it'll yield two to three bucks or maybe five bucks. You know, I'm like, doesn't, some of these things don't make any sense to me. But if you have, you know, a Polo Ralph Lauren bear sweater, for example, all of a sudden, I mean, the amount of power that thing has over every, almost everything else, Ralph Lauren, you know, like such commanding power, you know, in the selling arena for that. You can get out wherever you want. If you want to hold out for a big high price, you can do it. If you want to exit out and make, you know, what they call it fast nickel, slow dime. You know, if you want to make fast nickel, you can do it. I mean, but you have to have the right item. So I think as a beginner, or as an intermediate, like focus on the quality of the item. It's so important. The quality of the item is going to dictate how much power you have. You know, when you list it on Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist or even on eBay at the same time, you have power. And power is good. You want power. You don't want you don't want anything without power because then it's just doesn't feel right, it's dead, you have no energy behind it, and you know, it just kind of sits up and takes space. So yeah, <laughs> that's basically that. Um, yeah, just remember what I uh, what I told you guys. It's just advice at this point. You don't have to do it all. But uh, that's what these Q&As are all about. If you thoroughly enjoyed it, you found a couple of tidbits of something that you liked, or you felt slightly inspired by something, make sure you hit the like button. And also, also, go get the free guide, all right? So it's at bonafidehustler.com. Go get the free guide of 50 items, profitable items, 50 profitable items that you can be finding at thrift stores and garage sales right now. It's a brand new guy that came out two days ago. So uh, it is 100% free. You'll never see me charge for that one, but I think you'll enjoy it. it. Took me a while to build that one as well. Have fun with it. I'll see you on the next Bonafide Hustler video and good luck to anybody out there tomorrow that is thrifting or going to garage sales. Get out there even if it's raining or snowing or whatever. Just get out there and have some fun. I think you'll have, uh, I think you'll have great outcome. I'm going to bless this entire people out there in the in the feed with good cheddar luck you guys thanks for being here and thanks for being cool i'll see you next time goodbye